Welcome, everybody. Um, it, in case you're um, making sure you're in the right place, you're at the breaking down doors, selling to large corporations and governments. And um, <clears throat> I'm Steve Wilson. I'm from the University of Michigan, and I'm going to moderate the panel today. Um, what I'd like to do is first introduce the panelist, and then I'll uh, give you a couple comments of my own, and then we can open it up. I'd like to open it up quite quickly to questions uh, for the panelist. Okay, I had to really downsize this because everybody's got uh, so much experience here, but um, we'll, we'll start at the far end, and we have Tom Kelly. And Tom Kelly is <clears throat> with the Michigan SBDC. He has over 25 years of direct marketing, uh, and, and he, he did that for the 10th largest industrial distribution, or distributor, I'm sorry, in the, in the U.S. He spearheaded innovation and sales automation at Dow Jones and, and Company in New York as a consultant with IBM's uh, Salesforce transformation practice. Um, he's patented and launched revolutionary automatic 3D model generation software in the CAD industry. Successfully launched three startup companies over a 10-year span for angels, VCs, and corporate investors in the field of software, manufacturing, and technology, and uh, distribution. Tom has a BS in electrical engineering from Clarkson University and an MBA from the University of Michigan. Also, yay. Yeah, there we go. Go blue. Next on the panel... Go green. <laughs> next on the panel is Mark Lundquist. And um, Mark is the president and CEO of Fulcrum Edge, a business management advisory firm focusing on accelerating sales, marketing, and operations, developing business plans, and packaging companies for capital markets. Mark also creates some robust training programs. Uh, Mark also founded or co-founded three other companies and has taken one public via IPO. He's also the chairman and CEO of the Wireless Broadband Technology Company, and he spent 22 years in aerospace, defense, automotive, and high-tech Fortune 500 companies. He held executive-level positions with Bosch, Mansman, uh, Aeroquip, Vickers, Grimes Aerospace, Valcor, and Norgen. Um, he began his career at Sunstrand. Um, Mark is a mentor at uh, Ann Arbor Spark, Tech Town, OU Inc., and sits on the board and advisory boards for numerous firms. He's an executive faculty member for, uh, or was for Wayne State University, uh, the E2 Detroit uh, entrepreneurship program and an adjunct professor at U of M Dearborn uh, Graduate School of Business. Uh, he studied astrophysics and engineering and holds a uh, mechanical engineering degree at uh, University of Illinois. Next up is David Wang um, of Beats Analytics Technology. Dave is the creator of a core uh, logic that drives uh, Envision technology. Uh, prior to co-founding the company, he was the global vice president of engineering for Coma Body Welding, a fiat company. Dave also served as their CEO for the North American division. Dave holds a master's degree in electrical engineering from Wayne State University and an MBA from the University of Michigan. And last but not least is Trevor. Trevor Paul is the director of Pure Michigan Business Connect at the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, an initiative that was commissioned by Governor Snyder to connect Michigan companies with innovative growth opportunities. Um, prior to his role uh, there, Trevor founded the Connect Point, an economic development program with the Detroit Regional Chamber. Trevor also has advised White, the White House Business Council and the U.S. Department of Commerce on supplier diversity and matchmaking initiatives. In 2012, he was the Crane's Detroit Business 40 Under 40 to watch. He developed the Development Counselors International's 40 Under 40 Rising Stars of Economic Development. Trevor holds an MBA from the University of Detroit Mercy. 
and his undergrad was at uh, Grand Valley State University. And he's also certified in global affairs from the New York University. So uh, please, let's hear it for our panel. Okay, thank you for welcoming the panel. And um, before, I get, before we get started on questions to the panel, I would like to uh, just give you a couple uh, key selling points that I see, uh, have seen through my career with large corporations. And the, the biggest one for me is identifying decision makers. You really need to know who the decision makers are in the chain, and it is plural. There's not one person in that large company or in the government that is gonna say, oh, okay, we'll buy that from you. So that, that's really key, and, and what I like to do, there's decision makers and influencers. I like to break out of the influencers, the um, evaluators and the implementers. And in a lot of large companies, there are evaluators that are key to the decision, and they're gonna hand some kind of evaluation up the chain. Some of those evaluators are also decision makers, and they have evaluators of their own. And then there's the implementers, and these are the people that have to implement this service or product or whatever that you're selling them. And they're also very key to it because any one of them can sabotage your sale. And if you have them all covered and you have their heads all moving in the same direction, up and down, then you're very likely to make the sale uh, over missing one of them and not having them covered. And um, just out of attitude alone, they can... Uh, they could sabotage your sale. Um, with that, um, I'll go to the, the panel because one of the other points that I like to make always is, is when to stop selling. And uh, so I'll be quiet for a little bit and, and uh, we can go to the panel. I, I have some questions that I'd like to ask them myself to get things warmed up, but then I want to make sure that everybody else uh, starts participating and, and we'll ask some questions. And um, I'll start with Dave. And uh, first, um, if you could give them a little the elevator pitch about your company. And then, and then with that, what have you learned from selling your product to current customers that you have? Right. Uh, the first thing I want to clarify is I think uh, I'm, I'm the CIO of Command North America. I think, uh, I, I don't know how, if it's right or wrong. Maybe it's the, the Italian way of uh, pronouncing E is I. What I oh, did I say CEO? Oh, yeah. CIO. Sorry about that. Yeah. CIO. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, what we do is uh, we're a company actually uh, develop a technology, basically try to uh, bring out the, uh, we, we believe every automated machine or system out there has a heartbeat. Our, our software basically to make, digitize that heartbeat and bring the heartbeat out. And uh, once we have that heartbeat, we, we act like almost like the EKG for any systems or, or machines out there and uh, try to monitor it, try to give you predictable ability to see if it's going to fail. Um, so that's, that's basically what we do. It's, it's really a combination of IT and uh, automation and process engineering together. It's a, a very unique field and uh, very exciting. Um, so, uh, so just from my experience, I'm really not a sales guy and just uh, everything I said here is what I've experienced. The first thing I learned actually as the, really the in inventor, the first thing I learned is really it's not how innovative your technology is. It's how you can, you know, tell your customer what you can do for them. You, how you can translate. That transition is very, very difficult for me. You know, the first, I think, uh, nine to 10, uh, 12 months when we start, I was always so proud of the technology. Really never really understand how to, you know, sell this or, or pitch this to the customer from their perspective, what we can do for them. Actually, uh, one of the panelists here, Tom, actually, uh, was a mentor and in, in a way helped us to actually see the transformation, how we can look at things from the customer perspective. The second thing I think is really important is you really have to be uh, uh, you know, persistent, has a lot of patience. Because sell to large corporations, normally this, you know, when, when, when we first you know, started coming, we think this is going to sell like hot potatoes. It takes a long time. You go through, just like you said, a lot of people and uh, they are, you know, it's, uh, this guy will not his head, you know, you have a lot of up and downs, but you just have to stick to it. And if you believe a good product, you just have to don't give up, right? And, and you just have to keep doing it. And, you know, sometimes maybe you seem like all the hope is gone, but you still have to push on. And, uh, but, you know, sometimes you have some luck and then it strikes and then things just start going, going, going better. So that's, I think that's, uh, 
Uh, that's what I learned from, 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 from this whole thing. And the, the other thing, the last thing I think is really you'll be agile and flexible. You know, our technology was developed because, because our background was, was in the uh, very complex, fully automated machines. And our customer actually asked us to do the first line we, we, we did here in North America is a completely manual line with automatic, trans, uh, automatic transmission. And uh, we were able to use our technology to adapt, and uh, we, we were able to bring just uh, we, you know, tremendous result for them. And uh, I think those are the three things, if I, I ever say, can say, you know, sell to large corporation, that's what, what, what I learned. Great, thank you, that's great answers. And, and, and you know, it, it, it hits home with the answering all the questions, getting stuck on the technology. Mm -hmm. They're not asking you questions about the technology, stop talking about your technology. Talk about the, the solution and what's great for them about it. And, 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 and again, for all reasons, you know, many reasons, don't oversell. And, and, and really, uh, the, one of the key ones there too is not answering questions. Every question. You don't have to answer every question. A lot of people feel like they have to answer every question. And you really don't. And, and sometimes it's even beneficial because it's a reason to get back with them a reason for a second conversation. But, and with that, um, you know, and I, and I heard you mention Tom, and Tom's, he's mentored many people, so let's, let's jump to Tom and uh, maybe hear a lesson uh, that you've learned when you were a small company selling to the larger firms. Um, well, the, the lesson that I learned was actually throughout um, all of my career in selling, both when I was at a large company and at a little company, and what shocked me was how political the process is. And not just political from a corporation standpoint, but political at a personal level. So in other words, if you're selling to a very large corporation and you don't understand that there are winners and losers with your technology or your product or whatever's coming in, you're really gonna have a strike against you because there's gonna be sophisticated salespeople that understand how to play the politics within the organization. And if you've ever had the the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the background to have been in the executive wing of a large corporation or the misfortune to be in the executive wing of a large corporation, you would know that it plays out like, like a Machiavellian play. I mean, there, people are out to, in a, with a friendly voice and they'll put your arm around you one day and the next day they'll cut your legs out. And I know there's a cynicism to that, but that's a fact of life, that they didn't get to the board level or the executive level of a large corporation without understanding how you consolidate power, how you use the resources available to you to continue to consolidate power, and it really does happen. So you have to understand what you bring to the table, you have to understand who your champion is going to be at the executive level because you must have a champion that's going to defend you when you're not there. Uh, and secondarily, you need to understand who it's going to hurt. So let me give an example. You bring in software and it's going to eliminate some IT jobs. That CIO could say this is wonderful because you know what what makes me shine with the CEO is being cost efficient. Or that C CIO could be thinking uh, I'm in a, a a you know medium to large size organization for me to get a large CIO position next, I need to build my little fiefdom so I can show that I can manage lots and lots of people. So I don't want to bring in anything from the outside. I want to build it all in-house. And he will or she will fight you tooth and nail, even to the point of being illogical. So it's really important to understand that business decisions at the executive level, as long as everybody's checked the box of, yes, it'll do what you say it's going to do, yes, it'll satisfy what we need, the next box is, will it politically advance me? And you have to understand who's going to win and who's going to lose and how to align yourself with the right people. So as cynical as that sounds, I'm not a cynical person. Anybody who knows me know I'm one of the most optimistic people. But you need to understand that part of the business world at the large corporate level. Great. Thanks for that answer. Um, Mark, uh, what's the number one problem you see um, small companies making when they're trying to sell to these large corporations or the government? Well, um, I guess the... the what I normally see is everybody's working too hard. And uh, uh, my best advice is get lazy with your sales. I'm a lazy salesperson. And the reason I'm saying that is most entrepreneurs I can are... I attest to that. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's absolutely true. Uh, most entrepreneurs are really busy selling their widget. 
and widget sales won't get you very far. Uh, when Tom was talking about the corporate world, if any of you have been in it before, there's always those magic numbers about we're going to double our business in 10 years or five years or we're going to grow 20 or 30 percent. Selling widgets won't do it. And uh, I learned a long time ago, what you have to do is put your deal cap on. You have to figure out how to cut a deal, a big deal, whether you want to call it a home run initiative uh, or, or whatever sort of uh, uh, moniker you want to use. Uh, so the thing to do is, 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 if I can feed a little bit of what Tom said, is again, the big deals are going to be done at big levels. And it doesn't mean you can't get there being a little company either. There are plenty of ways to do it. You just have to understand how to do it. So either what you've got as far as the total solution is really going to do something dramatic for the company, or you have to get on par with them socio socioeconomically. And uh, uh, that is a little bit more challenging because most people are middle class, and they're not used to what the rules are like when you're playing with upper class, which is what most of the executives are at. And you have to understand what it's like to play in their particular sandbox, how they think, where they work, where they play, and if you can figure out a way to penetrate that, you've got a better chance of getting the audience that you need to cut the deal. Or you've got to figure out how strong your widget is as far as solving a big strategic problem and then trying to get that message across so they can see how it's going to benefit the individual or the company. And um, I'm with Tom. It's one of the reasons I'm not in the big corporate world anymore. I was at that level, and it ain't fun. <laughs> so, but be lazy. Great. You'll figure out better ways to do things with better efficiency. Yeah, they always say that a lazy person will find the easiest way to do it, right? Absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> Trevor, um, I guess, what is Pure Michigan Business Connect, and, and, and how do small companies participate in that? Okay, so you've seen Pure Michigan on your cartons of milk. You've seen it on TV. Um, and this is something that not everyone's aware of, but you will now see it on your trade missions and your talent initiatives. It's now a B2B brand. It's MEDC's B2B brand. It's the state's B2B brand. So I'm government. I can't tell you something you don't already know. I mean, you guys are out there every day chipping your teeth trying to sell an idea that you've given your life to, right? I can just give you refreshers and reminders. So I, I just want to, I guess, disclaimer that going in. Um, but uh, going back to what Pure Michigan Business Connect is, it's a, a governor's uh, driven initiative when he first took office. Um, one of the main, uh, I guess, switches from the Granholm administration was the focus on um, helping existing companies that had, hadn't left the state during its toughest time. Um, and so Pure Michigan Business Connect was an initiative to connect them, number one, to each other, change people's mindsets um, about competitors into maybe turning that, in, that relationship into a customer-driven relationship where you're actually selling to that person, um, but then also connecting them to global procurement opportunities and pro bono services. So um, our first um, major, I guess, announcement a couple years ago was that DTE and Consumers Energy were um, going to source uh, two billion more to Michigan companies in the next five years. Ford quickly followed suit, um, but then we also got some global purchasers to pay attention, like Boeing, DARPA, NASA, they saw the knowledge spillover they could get from the automotive industry while some of these machine shops and tech shops had capacity for that. So they were flying into DTW almost on a weekly basis over the last, I would say, two years. Um, and I'd pick them up um, with a sign with their last name on it. It's one of my proudest moments. Um, and, and I'd take them around to different shops. Uh, we took uh, a guy from Boeing on an Ann Arbor tech tour. And it took forever to get him out here. He wouldn't stay overnight, but um, he left saying, oh my God, why don't more people know about Ann Arbor, Michigan's private sector scene? All they know is the university. Um, and since then, Boeing sourced, I think, five million in contracts based on that visit. So my job and Pure Michigan Business Connect's job is essentially to bring these global purchasers to you. Um, we inventory their needs. So in Ford's case, we'll work with Ford and like 30 of their tier ones, identify 300 or so procurement needs and then arrange a day, like a matchmaking summit, where companies will actually apply, uh, buyers will read these applications, or in your case, researchers, um, if your technology is, is new and you'd rather work with an R&D team. Um, and then they'll pick who they want to meet with, and then that day will culminate in one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, throughout the day. We just did something with Ford, actually, that was, um, in one day, we developed 11 million in contracts. Um, 
So we're just trying to create a platform, and that's what Pure Michigan Business Connect is so far at 1.6 billion in contracts. Um, and you know that's just one program within the MEDC. So I mean, I could talk to you about pre-seed capital programs. I could talk to you about you know small business credit initiatives. We gave away like 79 million last year, uh, and over 351 loans to companies. That's almost a loan a day if you think about it. Um, and then even like our social entrepreneurship challenge, which would give away like. $3,500 to like a corner store. So there's different things. I mean, we could, we could talk all day about that. Um, but essentially, Pure Michigan Business Connect is your matchmaking platform. Um, and we try to get people, especially buyers, to change their perception that this isn't a sparks and steel type state. I mean, we're very high tech. We're number three in, in high tech job growth. And people don't realize that. So our job is to tell that story. Great. Thanks, Trevor. Um, now I can, uh, we can get questions from the audience. Has anybody got a question? You want to ask the panel? Trevor, you talked about the um, Pure Michigan Business Connect. Mm -hmm. For companies that do a lot of R&D and help um, in the laser industry, I know I'm on the platform, but I've yet to get anything out of it. What should I do differently? How it's do a, I network to get a part yeah, of that? Yeah, that's a good question. So ultimately, the state doesn't pick winners and losers. The buyers, you fill out an application, and the buyer will select who they would want to um, pick. Um, so it's all about relevancy, I guess, uh, previous experience. Um, they look at that a lot, certifications. It depends on whether you're in auto or aero or energy. Um, you know, yeah, yeah, or consumer products for that matter. And we're so niche that mm -hmm. I think it, it's very difficult for buyers to understand yeah. that they need to consult with the engineering firm first before they right. consult with the source manager. Well, I guess the, one way I could answer that is um, a lot of times people want to get into Chrysler, like that tier one contract. Um, but the truth is the business is at tier four level, not that you are like that, the tier three level. And, and you should use your local OEMs as connectors instead of viewing them as your next big account. Um, and sometimes, for instance, on that platform, people will fill out applications for certain things, whether it's manufacturing based or something more high tech like lasers, and they'll want that Ford business globally. But Ford knows, you know, you, you do a quick search, realize they have 10 employees and they can't service that. Um, but they're down that supply chain, there is someone who's been waiting to talk to you for years. It's just a matter about understanding that going in. I hope that answers your question. Hi, I'm uh, Tom Bobbini with Mobile Exhibit Specialist. I'm a real small company. Um, I contract out a lot of the supplier services. And I did use that website. Awesome, by the way. It was good to see that there was a way that I could reach out to people. I kind of defaulted because I was a one-person, smaller operation. And I think some of the bigger companies didn't want to look at me. So I, I took Mark's tactic, the four-hour work week there, and put it into play. And I ended up at, uh, with a General Motors as a client. Uh, I actually met with them in the Rensen. And it's funny, I had to follow suit politically, like Tom said, with the agency of record. My price was cheaper, but my quality of services, like on a broad scale, and agency of record weren't there. So GM ended up paying more money. And uh, we're doing the Super Bowl today. Today We're down there getting ready for it. But it, it was kind of funny. I had to play both angles. And uh, I, I'm still trying to get into Michigan. <laughs> okay. And most of my business is New York and L.A in the event trade show trucking industry, so. You know, I'd like to make a comment on that. I, I lost a very large job, very young in my career, $3 million to American Express. Uh, American Express was the client. We had the technology. We were the inventors of the technology. It wasn't patentable. It was software related. And we bid, they, they asked us to, to bid on it. Uh, it. Well, it wasn't a bid at that time. We had flown in. They said, you know, you got it. And we put together a package and we said, you know, this is probably going to cost us about $150,000 to put this all together. So we bid $800,000 to get this job. We lost it to an ad agency who bid $3.2 million. And before, I didn't understand the politics, their pitch against us was, how, how can this little company understand your needs? You and I both know 800,000 will not get American Express the solution they, they need. It's 3.2 million. And American Express said, you know, you're right. They're probably too little for us. They don't understand how big and complex this sale is. And boy, did I learn a lesson that day. Yeah, it happens. Next question. Yeah, I knew there were more questions out there. Uh, 
Hi. So I have a uh, high-tech company, uh, and I do a very advanced polishing on parts. And uh, I have a very large customer that, right, well, I'm not going to call them a customer yet, but I'm doing some prototypes right now. And by mistake, they forwarded some emails that were internal uh, to me. And I don't know if it was purposefully or not. I did read them. <laughs> but they were sort of chuckling that I was one person, and she probably does this in her basement, and, which I don't, but I didn't want them to know where my shop was. And uh, I, my husband told me to just erase all that and then respond to the email as if that stuff hadn't been there. But how do you end up, as a small company, you know, I'm smart, I know what I do, I can get the job done. How do you overcome misconceptions that a big tech company might have? And then when they do kind of slam you, I mean, do you just ignore it? Or should I have in that email, should I have responded a different way and said, well, actually, you might have not known that you had forwarded all these internal emails, but I do have a shop. So how do you handle sort of this? I mean, it, it was rude, and, and it, I sort of, and my response was I, I took it the wrong way, and so I didn't respond to anything. But I'm wondering, is there a better way to handle something like this? I'll, I'll take this one. <laughs> yes, just so I don't go down and... Yeah, in history here is the lazy sales guy, and it'll be the only thing you take away. So, uh, there's a, a couple of answers. Uh, one is, is uh, I learned something a long time ago, which is always make yourself look ten times bigger than you really are. So uh, it's funny, but uh, it, it, this is sort of taking the advice from the wannabes out in Rodeo Drive in Los Angeles. Most of them are poor, but they want to look really hot. So all the things that you push forward that, that are visual for what your company is, everything from your letterhead to the business card quality to your email addresses, all that, try to go as professional as you can because a lot of it is image. You know, I mean, even an $850,000 contract, but there was an image that you were a little guy and you couldn't possibly know what was going on. So uh, try to do everything you can from an image standpoint, just even the way you talk about your company. Uh, regarding your emails, it, it, it could have been an accident, or you might have a champion there that drifted them over to you. So uh, basically, you've got a mole that might have helped you out a bit. So uh, I don't know if that's if, if it's true or not. But um, you know, nowadays, sure, emails and still get sent on, and they can still be accidental. But uh, I would use it to your advantage. I wouldn't necessarily reply back directly to it, but I would reply indirectly to it when you, when you've got an opportunity fairly shortly. I would send out some information to maybe the people that are on that list, uh, going through and reselling yourself about who you are and what you do and the way you approach things. And that's sort of a way to address it without addressing those things directly. Well, I mean, they were talking about you. So clearly you have a solution to a need. Um, you know, I, what happened? Like, we all want to know what happened next. Like, did, like, was this just recent or like, to very recent. And they, they sent me the parts. Oh, thanks. They they sent me the parts to to you know the prototypes to work on. See, they want to work with you. Well, and actually, it was it was kind of rude. They they sent them on a Friday, and then they called me on a Monday saying, "Well, did you get them done?" Even though they had taken two months yeah. to get them to. You're getting me. tested. You know, I is that really that is yeah. it? And so then I actually got them done before the week before Christmas and FedExed it overnight for $65 and it sat on her desk for two weeks. And then she, you know, and I, so then I was like, well, did you get the next process done? How did it turn out? And she didn't respond to me for four weeks. But, but think about what's happening behind the scenes of the humor. I talked about the politics of the situation. Well, They're using humor to, to, uh, overcome their fear that says, look, we have, a, we have potential for a single source contract with a very, very tiny player. How can, we tr how can we have our eggs in that basket? You know, they're trying to run their whole business and you could have the best technology to solve that problem, but if you don't have the capacity to meet what their expectations are in terms of volume, in terms of, of throughput, in terms of turnaround, uh, they're going to be very, very nervous. So they're sending you a clear signal through that humor, it was wonderful for you to get that, huh. that says, I'm really concerned about your size. Yes. Right? Then that, that's what I would get out of that email, is that mm -hmm. I'm really concerned. You might want to think about how do I strategically partner with somebody 
that, that I can train to do this. Say, hey, I got the, you know, the workforce uh, at Focus Hope that's all trained up and there's, there's 50 of them I can have on the project tomorrow. You don't have to worry about my size. I can handle it. I got a backup, right? So they're telling you, I think, very clearly there's a, there's a concern there. Well, but what if I don't actually have all the machinery that I would need to ramp up? They'll work with you. If, if, if you have something really game-breaking, yeah. they know they can't live without, they'll work with you. I, I have an example. I, I uh, had to help a global aerospace company um, find this guy that had some, some certain Chrome technology, um, and he had a Gmail account. So, th but they wanted to meet with him. They flew in to meet with him. Um, so, I mean, I, I would just keep putting your best foot forward. Okay. I mean, it doesn't. I mean, don't worry about what other people think about you. Know, that's across life, right? Just do your thing, and I, I'm sure you'll be successful. Yeah, the fact is, I don't know how many in here are small business people, but. Uh, the reality is, unless you know, if, if you're trying to get into a particular customer or you're there now, unless they're nudniks, they all know you're small. <laughs> they, they know it already. Uh, you just want to put your best foot forward. And there's also, I'm, I'm a big believer in just ask the question. If you're not sure about something, ask them. Ask them straight out or anybody here if, if you know, hey, you know we're small. Is that a problem for you? What do you see are the problems? So it, at that point, you'll either know the answer and you might want to practice that, you know, with your spouse or somebody else, you know, a peer or so, you know, uh, get the skeletons out of the closet. What kind of questions might they, or what, might, what concerns may they come back with? Have your answers ready, uh, or they're going to get, ask you questions that you may not be ready for, so you can then prepare and tell them, okay, I didn't know that was an issue that you were going to have. Let me get back to you in, in a week or something, and we'll figure out a solution to that. Right. Actually, something just like that did happen, because she gave me a set of specs, and then I sent the, the prototypes, and then she goes, oh, this isn't what we wanted. And I was like, I took and recopied her email back to her and said, but these were the specs you gave me. And, uh, but, but one other thing I was going to say, I sort of have them in a corner, and I'm not sure how to, to use this to my advantage, but they, because I'm so small, they just want me to give them the technology, basically, and then they want to send it overseas. And I said, well, there's no way you can do that because of ITAR rules. And they were like, oh. Get it, girl. Yeah. So what I'm wondering yeah. is how far can I push that? Well, with ITAR, as far as how it depends if you want to go to jail or not. So. <laughs> no, 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 I don't want to go to jail. But I'm thinking, no, push it in the sense that, like, I would be their sole person to be able to do this. Do you have patented technology around this? Or it's patent this? pending right now. It's patent pending. Mm -hmm. So one of the strategies you might want to think about is you have a whole universe of customers that you can go out and target, right? And this is your first one. Right. They want the technology. Right. You say, I will license this to you, and you pay me a royalty on each part that you do, and you use that cash to buy the machines to get the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth customers. So you lose the big gross margin on that, but mm -hmm. if you live to fight another day, and you give oh, yourself the lifeblood that is cash. But wouldn't they have to... They would send that overseas, though. Well, no, in the license contract, it says, no, it must be produced, you know, here. It must be produced at this facility. Yeah. It's, it, I have to inspect it. But it's, then how do I, I mean, I'm one person. How in the world am I going to, you know, run and be the cowboy, the sheriff, on a corporation like this? I never said it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's scary with these big corporations. If I can add something, too, that I think will be relevant to everybody else. You mentioned about specs. I love specs, and there's a few reasons that you should go for them. One of the biggest problems that I see with small companies dealing with big companies, you're so hungry, desirable, um, you know, you're going in sort of doe-eyed that there's an opportunity now that you forget that you still need to set expectations. And because the big corporations, a lot of times, and I came from aerospace and defense first, we live by specs. So that's why I like them. But, but even in automotive, surprisingly, there's a lot of stuff that I see that's really loose. And even in aerospace and defense, you, know, you might have a spec, but then you start having the teleconferences going back and forth, and they change things and everything else. And before you know it, you're doing three times more than you need to, and you're not getting paid for it. But it's all about setting expectations. When you're a small company particularly, but this goes for large ones, you need to set the expectations, and a lot of that can be done by clearly explaining what you're able to do from a corporate standpoint and what you can't do, what your technology will do or what it won't do, what your services will do, what they won't do. And that way, you can have some very clear, defined lines. You can establish the appropriate pricing, 
and uh, and it, there's a lot less conflict that goes on. And when there is, you know, you can nicely go back like you did, have the email say, well, you know, here's what we outlined, and you know, if you want that, we can certainly do a um, change or whatever. But there's a fee involved. Has anybody ever heard of the GM hug of death? You know, it's like the only thing worse than GM not wanting my product is GM wanting my product. Yeah. Right, so you have these conflicting things, and David could probably talk to that because David sells to big corporations, and and he's he, when we started working together, there was just a couple employees, and huge growing pains. But but you know, he might have some good comments on that. Well, the IT industry invented scope creep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the the nice thing for us is really we we have a product that's you know is really you know in a, in a sense really unique and. Uh, Actually, right now we are getting their spec. They want to use, uh, you know, have our software to be able to incorporate other softwares. You know, they give us the spec they have, and we're looking at it. So, you know, you know, I, I used to work uh, in, in large corporations. Also, the you know, spec is very important, and you have very clear, de uh, definitive goals. You you can really use that to leverage yourself, right? Um, but. Uh, I think if I were you, I I I will hit that thing that you know heads on. If you, if you, if they send an email to you, you just you need to address it. You you cannot hide from it. You know you you, you know just just lay it out on the table. I mean otherwise, you know you you might be, you know that's one of the mistakes I think we you know we made at the beginning. We were hoping for something to turn around to to happen. It just you know you have to you know not not hang on one tree. You know if you technology compliant, go knock on other doors. Just don't you know think this thing is. I do one extra push, it'll be open, and uh, sometimes the extra push might take you a whole year. You know, it's just, really, I mean, it, it really, we, we have one OEM, we, we were starting, you know, at, you know the, the, we, our pilot was with them, and uh, now, you know, three years later, we just kind of cracked the door. Yeah, really it is. I mean, just there's a door after that, a door after that, just there's doors after doors. Even though you think you, the, the person you deal with, maybe, you know, I get up, and then, then it's done, it's, it's not. Uh, there might be other things behind that you do not know. I think uh, right now the best thing is you really need to understand if this person is really the last door you, you need to knock, you know, so. I think you're in a really good position. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And uh, we have a question down here. So. Thanks a lot so far. It's been very helpful. Um, I'm not sure if I can put it in words. Uh, we are a small startup and we do big data analytics. And we have a few customers. We were knocking on the doors of a big company. Um, they've been looking at our software. But the uh, question to you is, how long before you tell them, uh, you know, you can stop evaluation, evaluating now? And how could you convert that? Uh, because we see a couple of extensions of, oh, you know, we want to try a little bit more. You know, how long could we get it? And we're not too sure uh, because I'm an expert in a certain field. Um, and we have good relationships, so we're not too sure how to overcome and say, guys, you know, you have to stop and let us know what your thoughts are. Um, at, at the same time, the second question is, uh, can a small company make a difference in a product, solely on a product, or how much of a support could become an issue for a big company? And how do you counter that? So, two questions. Can I answer on the on the first one? There's there's a, a book that I enjoy. Uh, it's a business book, and most of them aren't very enjoyable. And most of them have about ten pages of quality, and the rest is blather. But there's a, a book that's been around for a while called Selling to Veto. Very important top officer. And I like a particular term in there that he refers to um, people usually in the engineering field as as see more, because they always want to see more. <laughs> My expectation is you're probably talking to the wrong department. They, the ones who always want to see more are usually the ones that can't make the decisions anyway. They make you feel like they can, but they generally can't. I've been sucked into those departments day in and day out. And uh, they like to believe it, but they generally don't have the signing power to cut the deal. So they just keep stringing you along. Yeah, and, and, and that, that will become very evident if you employ a simple strategy that says, the next meeting I have with them, I'm going to say, what you know, we've been evaluating this for quite a while now. I think you're happy with it, and we're continuing on this evaluation. We're delighted that you're evaluating our software. Uh, I want to work with you to understand what exactly do we need to show you that will result in appeal. Because, and small businesses are very afraid to ask for the order. Because you think if I ask for the order, they could say no. 
Well, God bless it. Let them say no, because they're totally wasting your time otherwise. So push them to a yes or no, and in a friendly way. And the way you push them is like, help me understand exactly what we have to show. You get it down on paper, and it's all there for everybody to see. And if they don't have the authority, they can't commit to that. And you'll know right away. I'm talking to the wrong people. They will not commit to what do I need to see. So it's a way to move them along very quickly and don't be afraid of the no. They may come back to you later. It's, it's powerful to walk away as a little company, even though you're so nervous doing it. I mean, it's about the worst feeling. You're walking out going, I think I just blew it. And you'll find they will come back to you if you really had what they wanted. I think the only thing I want to add is, uh, is where are you at? You know, do you have any other leads or any other? Because when we first started, we, you know, you know, like I said, this large OEM, we, we start three years ago, absolutely free. We got, we have nothing else. If that's the only place you can test out the technology, you might have to take a different approach. I mean, I, I think it really depends on where you are. Today, if if somebody come to us want a free trial, we we'll say no. We we'll said, you know, it's really depending on where you're at. You know, you you, you have to make that. Choice. Your other question was whether a small small company can make a real difference uh, in a product. When you're sell, selling a software product, obviously the support is an important piece of it. We believe that we have baked in a lot of intelligence within the product to help guide. It's like Facebook. You know, how many times do you call support to like something? Um, but at the same time, the big company's mentality is, you know, we need a team of support that we can call every day. So we're not too sure how we can show them, you know, that we're equal to or our product is superior in certain ways that you don't need a huge support staff. Um, I don't know that I can answer it necessarily, but I don't know that any of us know enough about your particular product and service levels. Oh, I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars poured into supplier diversity programs and small business programs virtually across every industry sector in the world. Um, in some cases in, in the U.S., they have certain percentages. Uh, that they need to meet with diverse candidates or small businesses. Um, so if you were to get through, they want to see you succeed because if the, you succeed, that's going to be touted at the you know the employee conference that happens once a year in Florida, and that's going to be touted in the press. I mean th that these people have jobs to meet you, um, and it's I know it's like kind of obvious what I'm saying, but if, if you're hinting like how can I make a difference at this behemoth of a company? I mean, that, they're asking you to, because people want to build their names within that company on, on you and your technology. Why can't you contractually set that up and say, what service level do you expect? Uh, you know, is it uh, uh, a certain, you know, percentage of calls that are answered on the first ring? I mean, you, when you quantify it, you can solve it. And you can set it up monetarily that says, okay, if we don't hit that, here's the refund structure. And then you turn around and run like hell to try and build up the staff to make sure you hit that. But everything can be handled with metrics uh, that they feel protected and they feel understood and not just, well, buy the software and you'll find out. <laughs> you know, that's a tough sales pitch, right? Yeah, the, reason, the reason that lawyers always get involved is because the specs weren't clear. If everybody understands what's supposed to happen, uh, you have a problem. Absolutely right. We have another Marriage question is, here. It's sort of the same way. You know, the, they don't lay everything out, so you kind of go into it hoping everything's going to work out, and a lot of times there's problems. Um, it's been very helpful. Thank you so much. My name is Oscar. Um, I live in Ann Arbor, and uh, I actually entered because I'm afraid of selling to big corporations and to big companies. That's really the, the reason why. And that's really why I chose to, to come in to listen to what you guys have to say. Uh, what Susan said encouraged me to talk, and the reason is very simple. When you have something that you think is valuable, and you're a one-man show, okay? Uh, there is a big uh, customer on the, other, on the other side of the U.S., in Seattle, right? And I've been hearing this long time, from a long, long time. Why don't you go and present yourself and, you know, it's, it's valuable what you're doing. The answer is, they'll do it, okay? I mean, they have a lot of money. I'm a one-man show. Why would I do that? Now, I want you, I want you to answer to that question for me. You're on the one-man show, selling something is somehow working, and um, you're saying, well, why don't you, when you go and sell to a bigger, bigger fish, should I do it? Why yes, why no? What do you sell? 
Um, it's a, this concept is very simple. Um, what you, when you make a donation, you can see where your donation goes virtually. That's pretty much what it is. Oh. So let's say, for example, that you go to uh, an organization that you really like. <clears throat> you go online, you donate 50 bucks. And what happens is that, uh, in, you know, they say thank you so much for your donation. But um, my company, what we do is to, we create the virtual simulation of where your money goes. So let's say there is a, a, you know, a kid in Ethiopia that needs to go to school. I put that $100 and you see the kid moving, moving around until he makes it to school. So um, it's been tested, it's working very well. People, call, it's more like a game, but it's really simple. It is, the concept it works fantastically well. Now, uh, the customer would be um, in Seattle, is, is a $1 billion organization. They receive donations for a billion dollars. Um, so, little guy, um, and what I do, pretty much, I, I outsource many of the coding and many of the uh, things that I do. Um, my sausage, sausage is pretty much, I know how to do it, because I, I did it for a long time, so I know how to engage people. Um, why would I do it? Why wouldn't I do it? Um, if I do it, they probably would like to hire me. I don't want to be hired. Well, one thing is, uh, first, uh, I commend you for being courageous to say that it's not something you want to do. Uh, one of the biggest problems with entrepreneurs, frequently, I should say frequently, a problem with entrepreneurs is they, they think they're good in areas that they're not really very good. And it's really important to take a close look in the mirror and figure out what you're good at and what you're not. And in the case of uh, being a one-man company, um, my suggestion is become a two-man company. But the reason, the way you can do it is get professional help. And I, I don't mean medical or psychological, but uh, uh, for, for example, I mean, we've had clients in the past where, uh, and some are, are moderate size, mid-stage, or large corporations, and they're not good at certain areas like contract negotiations. Sitting down with a Boeing or a General Electric or a GM, they don't know how to enter in kind of a conversation, particularly face-to-face, -face, when you're getting into, call it the heat of battle. Uh, so um, my suggestion in that case is if you know that that's a weakness you might have, or it's an area where, let's say the other way, you don't have as much strength, uh, Find somebody that can work with you on that. You'll undoubtedly have to hire them to help, but uh, find somebody like that that can work with you both in preparing you for that conversation and being a second set of eyes and ears or your spokesperson in that meeting. I recommend anytime you're trying to do a big deal, a big sell, or a big contract negotiation, don't go in alone anyway. There's, you need two sets of eyes and ears. I guarantee when you leave, the two of you would not have heard the same message. Uh, so have have somebody else with you. So so it, one of the biggest things in, in foundations is close rate per thousand solicitations. It's what they live and die by, right? They they go out and they solicit, and there's a certain close rate that they have to try and hit to build the coffers. Your product seems to lend itself perfectly to validation, which says, hey, let's take a week worth of phone bank work and let's put my product with it. And if your close rate goes up, we got a home run on our hands. If it goes up by a certain percentage, we know where we stand. You don't have to go and eat the whole elephant. You have to say, just give me a little piece. Let's test this, this hypothesis that I have, which says the reason why I invented this is because I think that this will drive bigger donations, more frequent donations, because people will feel connected to the money that just came out of their pocket. Why does it have to be, well, let's roll it out to a billion dollar company. Say, give me one little campaign you're doing and one little nut of that whole campaign and let's see what happens. Let's rely on the numbers to prove that what I'm doing is right. You have a product that they, that they can do another nut and another, you don't have to do this whole thing. You can grow forever with that one account and I would also argue you don't need to go after that account. There are, there are uh, foundations all over the country that are large to small that are doing donation work. Uh, and, and right here in Michigan, there are people all around you, uh, the Fraternal Order of Police. Go find out what they're doing because they call you. I'm sure I've been called a lot. <laughs> so, right? Start with them and say, and then you go to the big company and say, well, we did this with the Fraternal Order of Police. They went from a 4% close rate to an 8% close rate. Right? 
Great, thank you. I think we have time for like one more quick question, and that's about it. We got someone in the back here. Uh, I don't know how quick this is, but I'll try to be brief. Uh, I attended a few years ago, a, something was sponsored by Microsoft at the business school at U of M. And basically it wound up that the discussion, you know, it was about innovation, and the discussion wound up being that you get a patent and then everyone sues you. And then someone else gets a patent and everyone sues them. It's sort of the Samsung uh, uh, Apple war, except it seemed like this was the whole story. It was really depressing. So what I thought, and what I would say to this lady here, and I'd like your opinion, is if you've got a process and they send you a part, and you polish it, and then you send it back to them, you've got a process, and they don't know how you did that, and your best bet is not to patent it, but to trade, keep it as a trade secret. That's, what do you think about trade secrets versus uh, patents? I'm, I'm, I'm open to both. The... Uh, uh, Guy Kawasaki says it well in The Art of the Start when he talks about patents. Every, all the outside investors want to see that you have IP, and it costs a lot of money to get IP, but you're so blasted small that if anybody tries to steal it, you don't have any money left to sue them anyway. So you have this, this weird uh, combination of they want it, and there's nothing you can do with it. Trade secrets could be a, a good way to protect yourself, but it... it if you're ever looking for a capital raise, they don't mean very much, unfortunately. It's it's a trade. And any other the other side of it is how well can you protect your trade secret? Uh, you know, Coca-Cola puts theirs in a bank vault. But uh, if you think that you can seriously keep your trade secret secure, it's not a bad idea, especially with the new patent rules. Now the minute you're, you're going out for your patent, it becomes public. It used to be that way. So... That means I'm waffling on a decision. Thanks for the answers. Let's let's hear for our panel, everybody. And thanks for coming to the session. And uh, come back next year.